So why am I, as a neurologist, interested in coal? Um, the major reason for that is, well, first of all, as I, as I will explain, there are a number of neurological diseases where exposure to uh, the pollutants that come from burning coal are important risk factors. But at the present time, about 43% of the electricity that uh, we consume in the United States uh, is the result of burning coal. Now, it's falling. Uh, when I first made this slide, it was closer to 45 or 48 percent. Natural gas is increasing. Nuclear is staying pretty constant at around 28 percent. This is one of the first, uh, a table from one of the very first uh, publications uh, that was really prominent in the peer-reviewed literature uh, associating uh, death, serious illnesses, and minor illnesses with energy sources. And this was published in The Lancet in 2007. Uh, and for lignite, which is a, a poor quality of coal, uh, and other coals, somewhere between 25 and 30 deaths per terawatt hour of electricity generated from coal uh, result, with somewhere around between 225 and 300 serious illnesses and uh, between 10 and 20,000 or so minor illnesses. And to give that some perspective, we generate about 4,000 terawatts of electricity in the United <coughs> States each year. And electricity, of course, is essential for uh, modern society and certainly essential for modern medicine. Now let me skip uh, now with, after that uh, brief introduction to some of the health effects that are associated with the life cycle of coal. Uh, probably everyone in the room has at least heard of black lung disease, uh, which in the medical literature is referred to as coal workers pneumoconiosis. This is a serious uh, disease that affects somewhere between three and seven or eight percent of miners who work uh, in mines. It's more prevalent among underground miners, as you might expect. Uh, and it's related to exposure to the dust that's associated with mining. Now because of the uh, serious nature and the high prevalence of black lung disease, there was a federal re re regulation uh, law passed in 1969 that defined better the working conditions uh, for coal miners. And as a result of that, uh, you can see here that these different colored bar graphs representing different mine sizes uh, between the 1970s and the 80s, there was uh, a fairly significant reduction in the prevalence of uh, coal workers' pneumoconiosis. But beginning in the 80s, these regulations were increasingly ignored and not enforced by the federal uh, people who were charged with doing that. And this has become a particular problem among miners who work in the smallest mines, those that employ fewer than 50 uh, workers as represented by the red bar, which shows uh, that the prevalence of coal workers' pneumoconiosis is almost back to the, where it was before the 1969 uh, law took effect. Now, you don't need to be a coal miner to suffer adverse effects of uh, the mining operation itself. And this is the result of an epidemiological study that was done in West Virginia, where there's a lot of coal mining. And these investigators surveyed uh, inhabitants of the various counties in West Virginia with questionnaires where there were self-reports of uh, disease symptoms and disease, uh, whether or not individuals had various diseases. And they found that as uh, the amount of coal produced in a county increased, health status worsened and rates of cardiopulmonary disease, lung disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and kidney disease all worsened. And a, one example of that is for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that is emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Uh, if you lived in a county where four million tons or more of coal were mined each year, uh, the <clears throat> odds ratio for developing chronic lung disease were about 50 to 60 percent higher uh, than if you lived in a, in a county where less coal was mined. Now, uh, Andy took me down to the Amtrak station today, and this was apparently one of the rare moments when a coal train was not driving through uh, <laughs> Omaha. 
But he said every 15 or 20 minutes or so, you can see a, a large train full of coal uh, moving from the Powder River uh, Basin to uh, <coughs> to coal-fired power plants in the eastern part of the United States. And about 70% of all rail traffic is related to coal transportation, so that's probably not a skewed figure. He said the other large uh, transportation uh, that you would see there would be tank cars filled with uh, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, and rail accidents are much more common per 10 mile uh, on the railroads than uh, road traffic. And in, in addition to the rail accidents, the diesel locomotives of both locomotives, uh, of diesel engines of both locomotives and trucks that also transport coal produce large amounts of particulates uh, and from wear and tear on the roads that are also a source of health problems. So transporting the coal from the mine to the power plant is a, is a problem. And this is a photograph of a derailment uh, that took place a, a little over a month ago, a month and a half ago now. Uh, and two women who happened to be near the train track were killed uh, when this uh, coal train uh, jumped its tracks. Now clearly the um, most important health, adverse health effects <coughs> stem from the hazardous air pollutants that are released into the atmosphere by burning coal. And these, uh, uh, in uh, <clears throat> 1998, uh, the EPA reported to Congress that some 67 different hazardous air pollutants were released by, in a survey of a cross-section of power plants in the United States. And these include oxides of sulfur and nitrogen, arsenic, beryllium, cadmium, chromium, mercury, nickel, hydrochloric, and hydrofluoric acid, dioxins, formaldehyde, and also small amounts of uranium and thorium. Now coal is not just a lump of carbon sitting there waiting to be burned. It's most, of, most coals are sedimentary rocks. Uh, anthracite coal is uh, a metamorphic rock because it's been squeezed and subjected to even more heat. But bituminous coal uh, and subbituminous coal and lignite are all sedimentary rocks. And depending upon the conditions under which these rocks were formed, they have other stuff in them other than the plant matter that gave rise to them. So for example, if the coal was covered by seawater, seawater typically has more sulfur in it, and that the coal will have uh, more sulfur in it, giving rise to oxides of sulfur when it's burned. Most of the coal that's produced in the Appalachian Mountain regions of the United States contains between one and three percent sulfur by weight. So, you know, few percent of all of this, the, the coal is sulfur. And some of the mines in China uh, contain uh, coal that has as much as 10% uh, sulfur by weight. Uh, and has anybody been to China in the room? And what was it like when you stepped off of the airplane in, in what, Beijing? It was terrible. I mean, you, know, you wanted to bring your own air with you. Uh, so China really has a much more serious problem than the United States does uh, in terms of uh, health effects. And the Chinese are becoming more and more aware of that. But here we are in the United States. Uh, and when the uh, EPA was established and the Clean Air Act was, uh, was passed, the initial passage of the Clean Air Act uh, during the administration of Richard Nixon, EPA was uh, mandated to define what are referred to as criteria air pollutants. These are harmful to health and the environment and also have national ambient air quality standards which are either health based in terms of the primary standard or based on environmental factors for the secondary standard. And there are six of these criteria pollutants. I'm not going to talk any more about carbon monoxide or lead although I realize I've been uh, educated here that Omaha is uh, a major uh, lead contamination area from a smelter that used to exist here. The major uh, pollutants, the criteria pollutants that are related to coal are nitrogen dioxide particulates, particularly those uh, that are smaller than 2.5 microns in their aerodynamic uh, diameter, ozone, sulfur dioxide, not a criterion pollutant, because there are no ambient air quality standards associated with it, but also important to health is mercury, and I'll have more to say about all of these in just a moment. 
Now to put this in, uh, in some perspective, we burn about a billion tons of coal each year in the United States. Uh, this produces about 100 million tons of coal combustion waste or, uh, or uh, coal ash as it's referred to. And these are, this ash is divided into two parts or the, what's referred to as bottom ash where the clinkers that are formed in the boiler where the old coal is actually burned. And then small particles that are headed up the smokestack, referred to as fly ash. And the Clean Air Act uh, authority has uh, enabled EPA to establish regulations that mandate the installation of various forms of pollution control devices that are designed to trap fly ash. And along with the fly ash, many of the hazardous air pollutants that are being uh, discharged into the environment. That at the present time, coal ash is largely unregulated. And one of the ironies in all of this business is that as the air the, and the, the smokestack uh, waste that comes out of uh, power plants gets better and better but due to the installation of uh, pollution control devices, the ash that's left behind becomes more and more toxic. And at the present time, there are no federal regulations that govern how coal ash is disposed. Uh, and that's a serious problem. It's a huge waste stream. 100 million tons of this stuff a year have to be dealt with. And there are many communities now around the United States uh, where the heavy metals like arsenic are seeping into groundwater and poisoning wells so that they're no longer potable. And this is an example of one of the, you know, the really major tragedies associated with uh, coal ash. This is the TVA uh, Kingston spill that took place on December 22nd in 2008, where a dam that uh, was holding back uh, a lake of this coal ash slurry ruptured on December 22nd. The lake was, uh, the lake was 84 acres in size. And when this uh, dam failed, over a billion gallons of this coal ash slurry were discharged into the surrounding environment and into two rivers that were immediately adjacent to the TVA power plant. And most coal-fired power plants are located near some large body of water. Many of them are by rivers, some by lakes, and some by uh, artificial lakes that were created specifically for the purpose of providing cooling water uh, for the power plant. And so at all, many of these sites around the country, uh, arsenic and other toxicants are, leading, are leaching into the groundwater. And arsenic, you know, probably all heard of arsenic and old lace, uh, but arsenic is also a very toxic heavy metal. Uh, exposure to arsenic is a risk factor for a number of cancers, including carcinoma of the lung, urinary bladder, and others. It predisposes to the development of diabetes, type 2 diabetes mellitus and has other adverse health effects. So this is uh, nasty stuff. Now, contemporary epidemiological studies have made clear links between air pollution, particularly that that comes from coal, and the leading causes of death in Americans. And these are data from the CDC from the most recently available uh, st statistical compilations, uh, ranking heart disease as the leading cause of death in the United States, over 600,000 people a year. and Myocardial infarcts, congestive heart failure, and fatal arrhythmias have all been linked uh, to exposure to environmental pollutants, particularly uh, particulate matter. The fatal arrhythmia story is an interesting one. And this uh, epidemiological study was done by going to emergency rooms where patients who have implanted defibrillators uh, have go after they def after their defibrillator uh, fires off. Now these implanted defibrillators are little electronic devices that are implanted underneath the skin and they have electrodes that go to the heart. And it constantly monitors the heart rhythm. And when the defibrillator detects a potentially fatal heart rhythm disturbance, it initially tries to pace the heart like an ordinary pacemaker and if that fails, then it gives a big electric shock to the heart that uh, is designed to restore a non-fatal heart rhythm to the defibrillator. And I've, I've never actually talked to a patient myself, but I've read the literature and I've talked to people who have talked to patients. This is something that really gets your attention. In fact, uh, 
the, a number of people have asked to have these things removed because it's so painful when the defibrillator fires off uh, and uh, treats their heart rhythm disturbance. So when this happens, these people go to the emergency room and the technicians there can put a little radio transmitter and receiver over the pacemaker and retrieve information from the pacemaker that tells exactly when the rhythm disturbance took place and there's an electrocardiogram that's printed out so you can tell exactly what the heart rhythm disturbance was. So the epidemiologists take that data and then they go to the EPA particulate matter sampling sites where in some instances there are hourly or some form of periodic measurement of the concentration of the particulates. And they look for correlations between peaks in the uh, particulate matter concentration uh, and the uh, time at which defibrillators fire off. And so using these kinds of correlative statistical techniques that are a feature of modern epidemiolo ep epidemiological research, it's possible to show that when there's a peak in particulate matter concentration, the probability of having your defibrillator fire off is higher. And for that, the, 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 there are various kinds of controls that can go into that that I want to go into talking about. Now, more recently, a study that's very similar to that, but uh, is, uses as its endpoint, the disease endpoint, uh, an acute ischemic stroke. Uh, and similar studies were published this year, and I'll show you some data from that in a moment. Malignant neoplasms are the second leading cause of death. Respiratory diseases, the third leading cause of death, recently promoted from four, in part because of some changes in the definition of what they, what, how they group these uh, and define these respiratory diseases. But it seems almost intuitively obvious that the air pollution if it's going to have a health effect, it's likely to be on the pulmonary system. You know, things, so that things like asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, and cancer can all be related uh, to air pollutants. And as I mentioned already, uh, stroke, the fourth leading cause in the United States, 133,000 deaths per year in, that, in 2008. Uh, some of those people uh, are dying or being disabled because of pollution-related uh, cerebral vascular disease. Now, I mentioned before that um, the Clean Air Act enables the uh, EPA to establish national ambient air quality standards. And these are data that show how many people live in counties where these air quality standards are not met. And the two big offenders are ozone and small particles. And you can see that uh, 126, uh, 126 million uh, people live in counties where air quality standards are not met. That's about a third of the population of the United States. Now there are two things that I want, to, want you to take away from this uh, particular figure here, which is from the National Academy of Sciences publication called The Hidden Costs of Energy, which was published in 2009. Uh, one of the things that I want you to take away is just sort of the gestalt of where these power plants are located. The larger the circle, the higher the, the hidden costs in terms of health effects uh, are, that are associated with coal, uh, burning coal. And you can see most of them are along the Ohio River Valley, some along the Mississippi River Valley in the eastern part of the United States. Uh, that doesn't mean that you all here in Nebraska are free of that, but you know, you're in better shape than people who live in Steubenville, Ohio, which is one of the worst places to live in the United States in terms of air pollution and risks to health. So you'll see this gestalt of this pattern of, uh, of effects uh, in a couple of other slides that I'll show you. So this committee from the National Academy of Sciences looked at the 406 coal-fired power plants and using what are now considered to be relatively or very conservative uh, methodology, estimated that the annual health impact of these uh, power plants was somewhere on the order of $62 <coughs> billion dollars per year. There are newer epidemiological studies that are broader in scope that include things like contributions from mining and uh, global warming that raise this estimate by a factor of two or three at least. 
So this is probably a low ball figure for the health effects uh, attributable to burning coal. That turns out to be about $146 million per year per power plant in the United States. <clears throat> now the, one of the uh, major pollutants is oxides of nitrogen, and that's important in and of itself because oxides of nitrogen are pulmonary irritants, but perhaps more importantly is the fact that these oxides of nitrogen combine with volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere in the presence of sunlight to form ground level ozone. And if you think back to the slide that I showed you before uh, about the number of people who are living in counties where air quality standards are not met, ozone is the major offender there. Uh, and generating electricity is the third uh, leading source of these oxides of nitrogen. Sulfur dioxide overwhelmingly generating electricity, that is to say burning coal because natural gas has very little uh, in the way of sulfur in it, is by far the leading uh, source of oxides of sulfur. Now sulfur oxides are also uh, pulmonary irritants, but perhaps more importantly, they combine with other uh, constituents in the atmosphere to make these small particles or a large number of these small particles that are 2.5 microns in diameter. And the reason that these are so dangerous to health is because they're inhaled deeply into the lungs uh, where they can stimulate inflammatory responses and in uh, a number of other pathological uh, processes that have the capacity to affect the entire body. Uh, so sulfur dioxide in and of itself is noxious but perhaps more importantly, uh, the small particles that are formed from the oxides of sulfur in the atmosphere. And that brings us to the small particles themselves. Uh, electricity generation is the fourth source. Other industrial processes, many of which involve burning coal, such as the making cement. Not the window of the airplane, I could see at least one cement kiln uh, between here and Chicago on my flight over today. Uh, are uh, important sources of uh, small particles. And some of the research that's being done now, it's really on the cutting edge, uh, links some of these small the small particles that are the result of burning coal to disease uh, and gives uh, a partial pass to uh, the small particles that arise from other sources like the Earth's crust. So you can do chemical analysis of these small particles and using, again, uh, relatively sophisticated techniques, you can attribute some of the particles, particularly the ones that have large amounts of selenium in them, uh, to coal and coal-fired power plants. So this is an area that, uh, that I think bears looking uh, at in the future to see whether all of these small particles are e all created equal. They're treated as being equal by EPA because it doesn't have the capacity to do the, the chemical characterization that I think will come online. It's only been in the last couple of decades uh, that it's been possible to measure small particles uh, accurately and reliably on a large scale that's being done in monitoring stations now. Excuse me, Doctor. What's the number that was at the bottom? Is that pounds or tons? Uh, uh, I'm sure it's tons. Now, as I mentioned before, EPA and other agencies have monitoring sites set up around the country to measure small particle and other pollutant concentration on a periodic basis. But recently, it's been possible to use satellite technology to make these kinds of measurements. And that's what this uh, map is. It's a, a map of North America um, and shows the particulate concentration bet between the years of 2001 and 6 using this satellite-based technology. And uh, those of you who may look at some of the EPA websites like EnviroFacts, uh, where you can see daily air quality information, are switching over and beginning to use some of the, uh, these uh, satellite-based measurements. Now, this is the same pattern of distribution as the coal-fired power plants that you saw in that uh, figure from the National Academy of Sciences publication about the hidden costs of, uh, of coal. 
Now, particulate matter has uh, been linked uh, to the development of cardiovascular disease in a number of important studies. Two of these are the Harvard, so-called Harvard Six Cities study, where there was a 26% increase in the mortality in the most versus the least polluted cities. The American Cancer Prevention Study that also uh, linked uh, all-cause and cardiopulmonary mortality with increases in particulate matter concentration. And some of this I've mentioned before, other studies show increases in acute myocardial infarct, defibrillator discharges, uh, and myocardial ischemia uh, to concentrations of small particles. Oops. Stroke has been linked to air pollution in two studies, the one done in Korea and another one done in Taiwan. Uh, <clears throat> the Women's Health Initiative, I think, is a particularly important study uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, this study included over 64,000 women, postmenopausal women, who at the time that they were screened were judged to be free of cardiopulmonary disease. And then they were followed prospectively for an average period of time, about seven years. So you had 64,000 women followed each for about seven years on average. So you have a large number of person years that went into this study. And the fact that it was done prospectively rather than retrospectively and looking at uh, what did granny die of or, you know, this, the, so that prospectively gathered data are much more reliable uh, and produce a stronger result in terms of the conclusions that you make for it. Uh, and this uh, study found that for an increase <coughs> of 10 micrograms per cubic meter in PM2.5 concentration, there was a 24% increase in the risk of a cardiovascular event and also an increased risk for a cerebrovascular event. And what they meant by a cardiovascular event was a non-fatal heart attack, the need for emergency coronary bi artery bypass surgery, uh, or uh, um, there was one other endpoint, I can't remember what it is right now. But these are not trivial uh, disease endpoints. And these are the data from the stroke study that, that I mentioned before. And you can see that uh, between 12 and 14 hours before the onset of a stroke, uh, the relative risk uh, the, or the odds ratio for developing a stroke reaches a peak. Uh, so either before that or after that, uh, the odds ratio is lower. So these are the kinds of epidemiological data that are tying uh, acute strokes that are diagnosed by a neurologist uh, in an emergency room setting where there's a very high reliability that in fact the patient has had a, had a stroke. I can't tell you how many times I, uh, as a practicing neurologist, uh, I got called down to the emergency room to see somebody who had had a stroke who turned out to have something completely different. Uh, and as a part of contemporary stroke therapy, it's important to establish exactly, if possible, when that stroke took place because there are important therapeutic decisions that are made on the basis of that timing. So these are really good data uh, that link uh, acute strokes to particulate matter concentration. I'll skip this one. This is a survey of the Medicare population that shows, again, cerebrovascular disease, uh, heart rhythm disturbances, and congestive heart failure uh, links to particulate matter concentration in the Medicare population. Let me switch now to mercury and burning fossil fuels, particularly coal, is the single most important uh, anthropogenic source of mercury. Now the mercury naysayers will say, well, mercury is a natural compound. It comes from volcanoes and there's a certain amount of exposure that's unavoidable. And that all of that is true. But the fact remains that uh, we're dumping large amounts of uh, mercury into the environment every year as the result of burning uh, coal. <clears throat> and this is a worldwide mercury deposition map that uh, was uh, published by the United Nations Environmental Program in their Global Atmospheric Mercury Assessment in 2008. And here you can see once again in the United States where the, the majority of the coal-fired power plants are located is the sort is the heaviest deposition of mercury. Also, Eastern Europe. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to Kosovo, 
uh, on a fact-finding expedition for the World Bank that they're interested. The Kosovo government wants to build a, a power plant that would be uh, fueled by lignite, uh, and I'm going over there to check out various stuff. Here's China, clearly the leading uh, source of uh, coal-related pollution. They burn much more coal than we do in the United States. And this, this pollution, uh, although it may arise from a point source, is not limited to, to that source. And this is uh, a computer simulation of a mercury emission from East Asia. And you can see that here's East Asia, and it's, these wind currents sweep across the northern Pacific and cause some of this mercury to be deposited in the United States. I was in Alaska in uh, February. No mosquitoes in Alaska in February. <laughs> Um, and the people in Alaska are really uh, concerned about mercury in their uh, salmon uh, streams uh, as a potential source of uh, contamination of that food source. And this is how mercury gets uh, from the power plant into us. It comes out the stacks, uh, it goes into the atmosphere, it collects in little droplets, falls to the ground in rain, into waterways, and in the waterways there are bacteria that convert this elemental mercury into methyl mercury. And it's methyl mercury that's the most dangerous. It crosses cell membranes freely, and in fact is concentrated uh, as it makes one uh, a pass from uh, one form to the next. So, and this occurs in humans, so that the average concentration of mercury in fetal blood is about 1.7 times that in the maternal <coughs> blood. Uh, so it's by eating fish that eat smaller fish who have eaten so smaller fish that have eaten uh, plankton uh, that mercury uh, is, reaches humans. And the major fish are the large tuna, uh, swordfish, king mackerel, and tilefish. Many fish are almost completely free of mercury uh, and can and should be consumed because of the health uh, benefits, uh, particularly those associated with omega-3 fatty acid uh, ingestion, which is omega-3 fatty acids are important for the formation of cell membranes, particularly in the brain. Now, this I said mercury bioaccumulates as it goes up the food chain, and this is a study uh, that was done in freshwater lakes in uh, northeastern United States. And uh, on the y-axis here is a logarithmic scale, so at the top, the concentration of mercury is about a million times higher than it is at the bottom. So this is the concentration of uh, methylmercury in the water, and here at the top, a uh, million times greater, the concentration of methylmercury in loons, which are birds that uh, eat fish almost exclusively as their diet. Uh, somebody at dinner today said, crazy as a loon, and that just hadn't uh, occurred to me, but... Uh, <laughs> But it certainly it's, it goes right there along with mad as a hatter, um, <clears throat> which is also thought to be a mercury-related. Uh, so don't eat loons. Uh, <laughs> it probably tastes terrible. Uh, which fish did you say were free of mercury? Uh, I didn't say which ones were free, but the, the ones that are, uh, all of the salmon that come from Alaska right now contain uh, amounts of mercury that are below uh, threshold levels for health concern. And, uh, there are a couple of source, sources of information. There's probably a Nebraska State Fisheries and Wildlife uh, website that will tell you where there are fish advisories posted on streams and uh, lakes in Nebraska and may name certain species of fish that should be avoided. Uh, there's also EPA sites and FDA websites. And there's also, if you go to the Physicians for Social Responsibility website, psr.org, and uh, search for healthy fish and healthy families, there's a pamphlet there. But it's the, the fish that are sort of at the bottom of the food chain that don't eat other fish that are the ones that are the safest uh, to eat. So wild-caught salmon, particularly from uh, Alaska, certain farmed fish, it depends upon where they're farmed, how much mercury they're likely to have in them. Uh, so mercury ha is important because it has an important impact on uh, the develop developing brain. Uh, it's a neurotoxin, and uh, using 
relatively conservative measure is the annual lost productivity due to mercury and exposure among Americans is somewhere around $8 billion, uh, with an estimated range between 2 and $44 billion. And uh, the EPA and some of its most recent assessments, uh, their data indicate that the Americans who are the most highly exposed, and these are African American women who live in the southeastern part of the United States, who consume fish and feed fish to their families that they catch themselves in the waterways of the Atlantic coastal plain. And they do that as the source of protein in their <coughs> diet. And the, the women who consume the most fish in that area may have uh, enough mercury so to reduce the IQ of their children between 7 and 11 points. These women uh, in the highest exposure group consume uh, as much as 100 times the so-called reference dose uh, for mercury, which is the dose that EPA, based on a National Academy of Sciences report, says is the most that you should eat in order to avoid uh, adverse health effects. There probably is no uh, concentration of mercury that's completely free of health effects. It's just as the concentration gets lower and lower, it gets harder and harder to measure these small uh, increments. So let me uh, switch now from these health effects to some of the things that we need to be thinking about very seriously in the future, global warming. Is it real? Yes. Is it due to human activity? Uh, there's very convincing uh, lines of evidence that show that this is uh, in fact the case. Uh, there's a very high correlation with fossil fuel consumption and changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> there's a scientist by the name of Keeling who set up an observatory on Mauna Loa, observatory, uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii and he developed a technique for making accurate measurements of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And he began doing that work in the late 1950s. And since then, uh, this ob observatory has been in continuous, op observ continuous operation. Sorry. And what he shows in this curve <coughs> is that every year, the, the average concentration gets a little higher. And there is a peak that's reached in early spring and then the concentration of mercury, of, sorry, carbon dioxide. Uh, the carbon dioxide concentration peaks in spring and then falls a bit in the summer as plants and trees in the northern hemisphere grow and trap carbon in the wood and the plant, plant material. Now his son took up where his father left off and developed a method for measuring very, very tiny changes in the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. That's a lot tougher problem from a chemical point of view because the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere is really high. About 21% of all of the air that we're breathing is oxygen. And measuring something that's a really tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that is tough. It's a tough analytical problem. But he succeeded in doing that. And in chemistry, you probably learned that you combine carbon with oxygen to make carbon dioxide, right? Well, what the, the two Keeling curves, when put together, shows that when uh, the carbon dioxide concentration starts to go up, the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere takes a bit of a dip, just as you would expect, so that there's good evidence that there's carbon that's combining with atmospheric oxygen to make the carbon dioxide that's increasing in quantities. And finally, there's uh, <clears throat> another intriguing line of, uh, of evidence that's based on the ratios of carbon-12 and carbon-13 uh, in carbon dioxide. Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are non-radioactive, stable, isotopic forms of carbon. They were formed in supernovae a long time ago. It turns out that plants uh, that use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis use one of these isotopic forms preferentially over the other. I don't know quite why that works, but it does. So that the carbon that's trapped in plants has a slightly different carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio than the carbon that you might find in, the, in uh, 
limestone, for example. And scientists who have been looking at the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 in the atmosphere using atmospheric samples that have been gathered over long periods of time have found that this ratio is, going, is moving in the direction of the plant ratio and away from the ratio of uh, carbon-12 and carbon-13 that uh, was found in very old air samples or in other sources of carbon dioxide. So the conclusion is that this, the increase in the atmospheric carbon dioxide is coming from plants, and the most reasonable source for that is burning coal, which started off as a plant uh, at some point in time, or some other fossil fuel like natural gas uh, or, or fuel oil. Now, I'll talk also a bit about health effects uh, of uh, global warming, heat illnesses, drought, and flood. I mean, you live in Nebraska, for heaven's sakes, you know all about drought infectious diseases, uh, and environmental refugees. Now these are some data, uh, some of which are quite controversial, uh, from actual temperature measurements at various sites throughout the, uh, the world, done by four groups who have worked independently, but they've all come up with basically the same conclusion. So each of these different colored graphs is a different group, uh, one from NOAA, another one from NASA, this is a university in England, and these guys from Berkeley Earth uh, just published their data earlier this year in the form of an op-ed in the New York Times for which they got quite heavily criticized uh, by sort of ignoring the traditional peer review process. Uh, but the interesting thing about the Berkeley Earth guy was that he was a real skeptic about climate change and temperature changes. And he was funded by the Koch brothers uh, who are, I mean, I've seen a couple of people smiling and shaking their heads. <laughs> They're not climate skeptics. They're climate change deniers. This guy, at least Muller, was a skeptic, which is a good thing in science, because you really have to be skeptical until you've got really good proof. <coughs> so this guy, uh, who was not convinced, this guy Muller, not convinced that uh, temperatures were increasing, looked at these data and said, you know, these people are right. Um, he has been kind of coy about what his pals of, from the Koch Brothers Foundation who funded his research had to, had to say about this. But between, uh, you, compared to the baseline between 1950 and 1980, global temperatures have increased by about eight-tenths of a degree centigrade. And this is because of the uh, so-called greenhouse effect. Energy comes from the sun, it hits the earth. The amount of energy coming to the earth from the sun has not varied. Uh, at all. There's very good data about that. Uh, so it comes to the Earth and some of it gets radiated back in, away from the Earth. And some of that that's irradiated back from the Earth uh, encounters these atoms or molecule, molecules of greenhouse gases and they're absorbed by the greenhouse gas and then re-radiated back. And so it's this absorption by the greenhouse gases and then the re-radiation back towards the Earth that's the source of the greenhouse effect. And this is a, a figure uh, from the IPCC fourth assessment that shows the concentration of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, the three most important greenhouse gases uh, over the last 2,000 years. And you can see that it, everything was trucking along pretty smoothly until the Industrial Revolution came along and then the concentration of these three gases uh, began to increase uh, dramatically. Uh, carbon dioxide is on a scale of parts per million, nitrous oxide, and methane are in parts per billion, uh, so that um, these, uh, ratio, the, the, although these curves look like they're close to each other, two of them are off by a factor of three, uh, a, a, a factor of, uh, sorry, a thousand, ten to the third. And there's one other, oops, one other feature here. These three gases have different potentials for causing greenhouse uh, global warming. Carbon dioxide being the reference point of one, methane is about 21 times as potent, and nitrous oxide about 300 times as potent. This is starting to get into very complex atmospheric science that I don't really completely understand. Uh, but, but since there's so much more carbon dioxide than the methane and nitrous oxide, it makes the most important contribution to uh, global warming. 
And these are data from the United States Department of Energy uh, that shows which countries uh, emit uh, carbon, how much carbon dioxide is emitted by different countries uh, in 2008. And these numbers are in thousands of metric tons. China is by far the leader, although on a per capita, ba per capita basis, the United States uh, is still ahead. Now, greenhouse gases and global warming is beginning to have an effect on worldwide temperatures and the effect on weather uh, and, and climate. And this is a map uh, that shows the extent of the drought that we've been dealing with uh, this summer. This is a map from August 28th of 2012. Uh, it's no secret to those of you who live here in Nebraska, nor to those of us who live in western New York, uh, Buffalo, New York, which, which is right here where I came from. Uh, the drought has been uh, really quite catastrophic. Uh, and in, at the end of August in uh, this summer, the World Bank reported that world food prices rose 10% in the month of July alone. And that 10% increase was the result of the drought that we're having uh, in the United States at the present time. And what this is going to do is, it's going to, by making food more expensive worldwide, it's going to lead to even more malnutrition uh, than people have to deal with uh, at the present time. And this is another uh, figure from the World Bank, and it shows uh, the prevalence of malnutrition uh, for kids less than five years of age and in many parts of the world, uh, nearly half uh, of all of the children are already malnourished. As food prices get go up, go up uh, due to climate change, this is likely to change as well. Heat-related illness, it's almost a no-brainer. If the, if the world is, if the earth is warming up, that heat-related illnesses are gonna become uh, more problematic. Uh, this is a, a temperature map of Europe uh, in June and August of 2003, uh, at which time there was a terrible heat wave uh, that killed a, about as, as many as 52,000 premature deaths. These are not people who would have died anyway or maybe got pushed ahead of schedule a little bit in terms, these are uh, people who, who would not have died uh, for some time, uh, but succumbed because of the tremendous increase in temperature. And what you can't see here is that these uh, darkest areas are where the temperature was about 10 degrees centigrade higher than it normally is. A heat wave is defined as uh, five or more days in a row where the average temperature is five degrees or more centigrade uh, above uh, climatological norms for that. So by any any definition, this was a very vigorous heat wave. Anyone here been to Yosemite National Park this summer? <laughs> no such luck, huh? <laughs> um, this, this summer, uh, there's been a small outbreak of hantavirus, which is a, a virus that uh, causes a potentially fatal uh, pulmonary disease in humans. Uh, and the exposure to hantavirus occurs through contact with urine, feces, or saliva of rodents. And people who lived in this uh, Curry village, uh, some 10,000 of them, uh, have been warned that they're potentially exposed to this hantavirus. There are six known cases uh, that at the time that I made this slide in early September, and two deaths, that's increased now. I think there's some 20,000 people who've been warned and, and about eight uh, known cases and two de three deaths. Uh, this is a disease that it's about 40% mortality rate. So although it's not a huge public health threat in terms of the number of people dying, uh, it's, this is one of the illnesses that's likely to become more prevalent as climate changes. The big ones are diseases like malaria, uh, dengue, uh, and uh, waterborne diseases like uh, cholera uh, that have very high mortality rates and pose enormous worldwide threats. As oceans rise, people are going to be displaced uh, as a result of rising oceans. And particularly if you live in the Nile Delta, the Delta, the Ganges and Brahmaputra, or the Mekong Delta, it's likely that between, that over a million people will be subject to displacement by uh, the year 2050, the way things are going. 
Let me just uh, speed up a bit here uh, and talk a bit about the Clean Air Act. It was signed during the administration of Richard Nixon, had a significant amendment in 1990 during George H.W. Walker, H.W. Uh, uh, Bush's administration, established the acid rain program and gave EPA the authority to regulate point sources, that is power plants and mobile sources, that's cars and trucks. And as a result of these <coughs> amendments, the concentration of uh, oxides of sulfur, as shown in red, and oxides of nitrogen is gradually going down. It's not low enough yet. Uh, and also, the EPA is required uh, by Congress in the, in the Clean Air Act to make periodic reports about the costs and the benefit. And this is uh, uh, the most recent report, which was published a, a little about a year and a half ago. Uh, and by the year 2020, the estimated annual cost of complying with the Clean Air Act is, is somewhere around $65 billion, $10 billion of that to coal-fired power plants. But the estimated benefits are in the order of $2 trillion per year. Now, I'm a retired person. I live off the income of my investments, and I don't have any investments <laughs> <laughs> that gave a, a cost-benefit uh, performance like that. Uh, and the EPA gets these, uh, you know, th those are numbers that healthcare economists uh, generate using models. I'm a physician, so this is what I see, 230,000 uh, 230, uh, fewer, fewer premature deaths, uh, 200,000 fewer acute myocardial infarcts, almost two and a half million fewer exacerbations of asthma so that the Clean Air Act is uh, really a good investment. And you hear uh, people complain that all of these burdensome regulations from the EPA are job killers. If they're killing any jobs, they're killing them in the healthcare industry because we have fewer patients that need our care. It's really one of the best investments that the United States is making at the present time. So we need to move towards a more sustainable energy uh, future, improve efficiency, use more renewable sources, rely more on wind energy, particularly here in the Midwest where you're really uh, uh, well uh, positioned to do that, and use more solar energy. And this is a map that shows the uh, photovoltaic solar resources in the United States. There's some 11,000 times as much energy that comes to the Earth uh, each year than we consume in terms of electricity. So if we were able to trap only a small fraction of that and use it productively, we would be able to solve our uh, energy problem. And this is a wind energy map. Uh, see here, Nebraska is well positioned to take good advantage of wind energy. Uh, both of these published by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So this is an election year. Ask your candidates if they support EPA's Clean Air Act and carbon dioxide emission standards. I didn't mention this, but EPA is beginning to promulgate uh, regulations that will limit carbon dioxide emissions. Speak to your friends, family, colleagues about the importance of clean air and protecting our health. And finally, join and support organizations like Andy's and mine, Physicians for Social Responsibility. So thank you for coming tonight. This is our home in Buffalo. We, have a, we walk the walk. We have a 4,400 uh, watt photovoltaic uh, array on our house that generates about 80% of the electricity we consume. Uh, we drive fuel efficient cars and we're replacing our compact fluorescent bulbs with LEDs when those wear out. So thanks for being here tonight and your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I have a, a few books left if anyone is interested in buying them. They're 25 bucks. Uh, you can buy them for $16 on Amazon, <laughs> but you have to pay for shipping and handling. <laughs> and it won't be signed by the author. <laughs>